Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, got another little uh, lecture here. I'm going to split this into three shorter ones to make it a little bit easier to follow along and pay attention. These all have to do with fish populations and specifically with one aspect of fish populations and that's density. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to talk about CPUE, then we're going to talk about estimating population size and several different ways we can do that. So, remember that a population is a group of interbreeding or potentially interbreeding individuals. And in fish, sometimes we call these stocks, and those two terms are kind of used interchangeably. Um, anyway, it's kind of a functional unit that um, we like to study. Now, in ecology, we say that populations have four characteristics, and now uh, maybe five. That's why I say five with a, qu a question mark. Those characteristics are density, age structure, mortality rate, natality rate, and the fifth one maybe is considered genetic structure. That's kind of a new idea here. At any rate, these are the things that define a population and help you understand how that population functions. And so when we're studying fish, the measurements that we take are to try to, to estimate some of these different uh, population parameters. And the first one that we're going to talk about today is density. All right. And you can understand how density is important to a population. The more organisms per unit space, the greater the density, you know, the more disease you have, the more waste you have. Um, but of course, you know, you have more potential mates. Um, maybe if you're a prey species, you've got a higher density, you can watch for predators better. Uh, density is just one of those things that we naturally understand to be important in any kind of a population. So probably the most common way that we look at density is CPUE or catch per unit of effort. And we've talked about this when we talked about sampling gears. We've talked about that we always need to measure what our effort is so that we can standardize things and look at the catch of our fish per unit of effort. So we're talking about fish per hour or fish per net night, or fish per seine haul. Um, all these different ways that we measure catch per unit of effort. And the idea is, is that if you have a higher density, then of course you've got a higher CPUE. Now, there are some advantages to doing it this way. Most obviously, it's quick and it's easy. And so if you go out with one single sample, you can get an estimate of CPUE. Of course, you would sample more than that, but it is um, less involved than determining the actual density of the fish in your population. But that is the disadvantage. Well, that's one of the disadvantages. Another disadvantage is something we talked about when we talked about gear, and that is standardization. Um, specifically, the effort part of catch per unit of effort. Uh, how do you ensure that two different groups are putting out the same amount of effort? And that is something that we work on a lot in fisheries, is to try to put out a standard effort, but it's just not an easy thing to do. Um, catch per unit of efforts are also not necessarily comparable. Uh, how do you compare uh, a number of fish per hour electrofishing to number of fish per net night trap netting. Uh, they're just apples and oranges. There's no standard unit you can use to convert them all to the same effort. And so uh, they're only useful compared, you know, within a gear. So catch per unit of effort electrofishing is only useful to compare to other electrofishing studies, but you can't compare it to a trap net or a trot line or something. That's another issue. And then finally, the biggest issue is this is not a density, okay? A density is when you count the number of fish in a given area and you determine how many fish are in that given area. That's a density. CPUE is a surrogate 
for density and is an estimated density. Now, again, we assume that if the density goes up, the CPUE goes up, and that's a fair assumption, but it's not necessarily true. So that is a disadvantage of using CPUE. Having said that, most of the time, we are going to be using CPUE because we simply don't have time to estimate the actual number of fish in the population. But we can estimate the number of fish in the population, and so let's talk about several different ways that we can do that. So this would be better than a catch per unit of effort because you don't have to worry about standardizing effort. You are getting an estimate of the total number of fish. So here in my pond, I could estimate how many fish are in my pond. I can measure how big my pond is. That is my estimate of density and that would be better than a CPUE, but it's much more difficult to do. It takes longer time. It takes more total effort. And so that's the trade-off here. And we are assuming that CPUE is correlated with density, but we often don't actually test that. Now, a good strategy would be to get an estimate of density and simultaneously get an estimate of CPUE and see if the two are correlated. If, if they are, then you can use the CPUE in the future because it, does, it is a lot easier to do. Okay. So we have many ways that we can go out to a pond or a lake or a river, any population of fish, and we can estimate how many fish are in that body of water. And so we're going to talk about several of those. The first and the most accurate is to drain the pond and count the fish. And this is very accurate because you are going to count every single fish. However, that tells you how many fish you used to have. Obviously, this is not a good long-term solution, but it is the most accurate way. This would be the gold standard of population density uh, estimates, is to count every single fish. But of course, we can't usually do that. Uh, something that used to be very popular and is not used very much anymore is a cove rotenone study. And this is popular down here in the south and in these big reservoirs like Kentucky Lake and Barkley Lake, where you would go to a cove, pull block nets across the cove, trapping fish inside, then roting on the cove, killing everything that's in the cove. And you go out, you pick up the fish, you count them, you also get length weight measurements on them, and then you extrapolate from that to the whole lake based upon the area of the cove. Um, it's very thorough. Uh, there's a lot less bias than certain gears. You don't have to worry about the size of the net or does the fish avoid the electro fisher. You pretty much get every fish that's in that cove. But you can see the downside of this. Um, tremendous effort, very expensive, and people aren't necessarily crazy about seeing all those dead fish. Um, it used to be that they would advertise it and people would just come out and pick up the fish and take them home and eat them. So it was very popular. It was a great way to get a lot of fish to fill up your freezer. And the rote known is just, you know, not toxic to humans. But um, it's just not done that way anymore. All right, the next thing that we're going to talk about is called a depletion estimate. And this works on small water bodies like the pond that's behind me. And the idea is is that we're going to take uh, a standard series of samples and we're going to take the fish and keep them after we sample them. So we're not going to sample them and throw them back. We're going to sample them and hold on to them. So we're going to deplete the population. And by doing this, we can get an estimate of how big that population is. So we're going to capture and remove the fish with a known amount of effort. And then if we, so if we have, since we have a known amount of effort and we have a number of fish, we can determine a catch per unit of effort. And so then we can plot that catch per unit of effort versus the total catch and then extrapolate. And I'll show you how this is going to work here in a second. But the idea from a practical standpoint is we pull a seine haul 
all the way across the pond. And that's one unit of effort. And in that seine hall, we take all the fish out, we count them, and we put them in a tank. We put them in a holding tank. We don't put them back in the pond. Now that pond has a little bit fewer fish than it did when we started. We have depleted it. Then we're going to do that again. Same amount of effort, same seine pull, and we're going to count the fish, and we're going to hold them in a holding tank. Now the pond has even less fish in it. And so each time we deplete that population. And so if we plot the catch per unit of effort versus the total catch, we'll get a figure that looks something like this. So you see the total catch is on the x-axis, and the catch per unit of effort is on the y-axis. And then we fit a line to these points. So in this example, you see we made like three pulls. And it doesn't, you know, I, I don't have any kind of units on here. It could be fish per seine haul. That's what this is. This is number of fish per single seine haul. But it could be any kind of effort. Um, but you see that as we the total catch goes up, the catch per unit of effort goes down. And then if we fit a line to this, we can extrapolate and see where that line crosses the x-axis. Well, what's the x-axis? The x-axis is the total catch. And so when the total, when, when the CPUE goes to zero, that's when we have caught every single fish in that pond, and where, that's where the line crosses the x-axis, and that gives us our estimate of total catch. So think about why this works. Our first seine haul is going to get a lot of fish. The CPUE is going to be very high, because there's a lot of fish in the pond. But the next seine hauls are going to catch fewer fish. Why? because there are fewer fish. We are depleting the population. Each time, you expect to catch fewer and fewer fish with that same standard effort, because there are fewer and fewer fish. You're not returning the fish to the pond. But you are keeping track of your total catch. So as your total catch gets higher and higher, but the CPUE gets lower and lower because it's harder and harder to catch the fish because there are fewer and fewer fish. All right. Now theoretically, you could keep pulling that seine through the pond and removing fish until you've caught every single fish in the pond. And once you've caught every single fish in the pond, your catch per unit of effort will go to zero, right? You cannot catch any more fish because you've caught them all. And so that's why if you plot the CPUE versus the total catch and extrapolate to where the total the CPUE goes to zero, that will tell you your estimate of your total catch, which would be all the fish in the pond. And so at the point where you've caught every fish in the pond, CPUE must go to zero. So that's why if we go to the graph, excuse me, that was a... <laughs> Hickory nut <laughs> almost fell and hit me. <laughs> Squirrels don't like me uh, making all the noise down here. So if your CPUE goes to zero, that will give you an estimate of the total number of fish in the pond. And so now look at this graph again and see how that works. Each time we pull the seine, we get fewer and fewer fish. If we kept doing it, we would eventually catch zero fish because we've caught them all. And that would be where the total catch equals the total number of fish in the pond and the CPUE equals zero. In real life, we don't want to do this. We're not going to pull until we've caught every single fish. In real life, we're going to take several pulls and then we're just going to extrapolate and estimate what the total population size would be. So that's a depletion estimate. It would only work on small water bodies for obvious reasons. Um, in the next videos, I'm going to talk a little bit more about other ways that we can estimate the total number of fish in the population. And 
So that's all I've got uh, for this one. I'll be back in a second with uh, Mark Recapture Estimates. So see you in a bit. Later. So now we are into the uh, second of our series of lectures talking about fish population density. You'll recall that density is an important parameter of all populations, and so this is something that we try to measure quite a bit. Um, you'll recall that we talked about catch per unit of effort, which is not really a measure of density, but we sort of assume that it's correlated with density. If your catch per unit of effort goes up, that's probably indicates that your density of fish go up. And CPUE is easier to obtain and takes less effort. Excuse me, but if you really want to know density, you have to have an estimate of the number of fish in your population. And we talked about some ways of doing this. You can drain it, count all the fish. That's the most accurate way, but of course it's impractical. Cove rote known is where you block off a cove use rote known to kill all the fish, then extrapolate. We don't really do that much anymore. We talked about a depletion estimate, say in a pond, where you take um, seine hauls or some unit of effort and you look at the catch per effort, and each time you pull fish out, you don't put them back. You slowly deplete the population, and then you graphically determine um, what you estimate the, po estimate the population to be. Now we're going to talk about the most common way to estimate um, the number of fish in a population, and that's a mark recapture. And so the basic idea is, this is not for fish, this is used a lot in ecology. The idea is, is you go out and you take a sample of organisms, and you mark them somehow, and then you release them. And you assume that those marked organisms will uh, disperse themselves randomly among all the unmarked organisms. And so you wait a couple days to give them time to do that, then you take another sample. And in this second sample, you are going to get a lot of unmarked organisms, but you're probably going to get a few marked organisms. And since they're marked, you know that you've already captured them once, so we call them recaptures or recaps. And based upon the number of organisms marked and the number uh, marked ones that you recap and the number of unmarked ones that you catch in your second sample, you can do some math and get a good estimate of the size of the population. So that's a mark recapture. <clears throat> so the first question is, what are some ways that we can mark a fish? And there's lots of ways we can mark a fish. First thing we're going to talk about is a fin clip, which is exactly what it sounds like, where you just clip off a part of the fin. Of course, you try to find a fin that, that, you know, uh, 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 that you can clip that won't really affect their swimming behavior. The fin usually regrows. If it doesn't regrow, then you can notice that here's a, you know, a fin that's been cut off. Usually the fin regrows, but when it regrows, the fin rays are disrupted, and they're kind of hanky. And an experienced eye can look at that and go, oh, that's a, fi that's a fin that's been clipped. But it's easy to miss these marks if you don't know what you're looking at. And so you simply cut a piece of the fin off. Here's an example of a carp that has been, it's a recap. These are carp that we were fin clipping to estimate the population size. And you can see, if you look at these pelvic fins here, you can see the clipped one, which is the left one, which is closer to you. You can see how that's, you know, stubby. It's shorter than the other one. And you can see how the rays are kind of bent. Now, eventually, we would expect this fin to grow all the way back, so they'd be the same size, but you can still see how the rays kind of have a, you know, a disruption to them, which you can see here. And so, um, you know, if you know what fin to look at, you know what you're looking at, you can tell that this is a recap. And here's another example. You can see how the, the clipped fin is shorter, but more importantly, you can see how the rays are not nice and straight, and that indicates that this is a fin-clipped fish. You can also do things like use a simple hole punch. Right here you see one in the dorsal fin, which is not going to affect that fish's swimming behavior at all. Another way to mark a large number of fish, especially small fish, is with a freeze brand. Um, so it's just a cold piece of metal, you hold the fish up against it, and you can see it makes a little mark on there, which will disrupt the scales, and it should retain this mark for a long time. And by changing the orientation of the mark and where it's given, you can mark different batches of fish in a different manner. But you can mark a lot of fish quickly this way. 
The most common way that we're going to mark fish is with an external tag, um, which is just what it sounds like. It's just something that's clipped on, that hangs off the outside of the fish. There's tons of different ways to do this. A lot of research goes into which ones work best and affect the fish the least. Um, a big thing that we look at with external tags is tag retention. Tag loss can be significant. Um, and you can, uh, a lot of times you'll have an estimate for how much tag loss you're going to have. So you can adjust your numbers based upon that estimated tag loss because these things are hanging off the outside of the fish and they can get rubbed off or, especially if you're not experienced and you don't do a good job of attaching the tag, it can fall off. And you can see here all the many different ways that we can tag a fish. And usually these will have some kind of identification number on them. They might have your phone number. They might have a reward. So if somebody else catches your tag, they can get in touch with you. Catches your fish, they can get in touch with you based upon the tag information. Uh, we use Floyd tags a lot. Floyd's the brand name. They call these T-bar tags. I think spaghetti tags sometimes. And there's a T anchor at the base. So you've got the tag and then there's a little T anchor. And this T part goes into the fish. So you've got a needle so that the T is inserted this way and then it spreads out like that. And the trick is, is to get this between a couple of pterygiophores. And if you remember, pterygiophores are those little bones at the base of the dorsal fin, and they got little muscles on them, and they're used to um, extend the dorsal fin. And so the muscles contract in the pterygiophores lever and attach to the rays and extends the fin. And so you've got these little pterygiophores all along underneath the dorsal fin. And if you can get that T-bar in between them so that it locks, that will help keep that Floyd tag in the fish. If you're not good, and if you don't get those down in there, then that tag will come out very easily. Another cool way to mark fish, um, it's used a lot in reptiles too, it's fluorescent elastomer tags. It's kind of a, a soft, flexible, non-toxic, non-reactive plastic that kind of, when you inject it, then it kind of firms up, but it has a number of different colors. And these colors will fluoresce if you have the proper light. And so you can pick up a fish and you can just see the colors. Or if you've got clear water, you can shine a light and look for them to fluoresce. Um, you put it just under the skin. It's really not very invasive. They put them on the cheeks of fish a lot of times. Sometimes in the fins. And um, you can just use different combinations of colors in different locations and mark different batches of fish. I don't have a picture of a fish, here's a picture of a frog, and you can see the nice little orange bands on there. We also have internal tags. And so the internal tags are a little bit more invasive, but they're more useful, they stick around longer. Um, you've got things like pit tags, passive integrated transponder tags. So if you've ever had a dog or a cat and you've had them microchipped at the vet, that's a pit tag, okay? It's a little thing, it's like a grain of rice, it's just injected in the skin in your dog. It's injected in the abdomen of your fish. And there's no battery or anything. It's just passive. But when you run a wand over it, that wand sends out some energy that excites the tag. The tag sends back a different wavelength of energy, which the wand also detects. And that, that signal that comes off the tag once it's excited has a unique identifier. So if it's your dog, the vet will wand it. Hey, here it's got an ID number, puts it in the computer, they can reunite you with your, your dog or your cat. If it's a fish, you know, you just wand it, you say, oh, here, and I can tell individual fish. And that's a pretty big advantage. You can also, if you have a choke point, a narrow area, you can put receivers on either side. And if your fish swims through, then it will detect the pit tag. Um, nasal tags and coated wire tags, these are just small pieces of metal. Usually they're used when you've got a small fish, like if you're stocking a large number of, of fish from a hatchery. And you can tag a bunch of fish very quickly. It's a very small piece of metal, so it's not very intrusive. They're, there's, um, they're easy to attach. And then the way you can detect them is just with a metal detector. You catch a fish, you wand it with a metal detector. If the metal detector goes off, hey, this is one of my tagged fish.
And you can either say, okay, that's a recap, or if it's a coated wire tag, you can uh, sacrifice the fish, dissect out that little piece of metal, put it under a microscope, and there'll be a code on there. Um, now around here, we've been doing a lot of research with sonic tags, and these are a little bit bigger. The ones we use are about the size of a roll of dimes. And you just knock the fish out, cut a small incision, you insert the tag, sew them back up. Once they recover, they can swim off. But this sonic tag emits a sonic signal that is unique to that fish. And so you can go around and put a hydrophone in the water and listen. And if you hear that tag, and you can identify the individual numbers from that tag, then you can identify that fish and you can follow that fish and you can look at their movement behavior. Or you can put a hydrophone that just sits out in the lake. And when a fish swims by, it detects that fish and records which fish it was. So here's what these things look like. You see the pit tags, they're about the size of a grain of rice. And you can see in the other picture we've got a catfish and they're inserting a, a sonic tag and then that will be sutured up and and then when the fish recovers they're set back into the lake. Here's how uh, you apply a coated wire tag or a nasal tag. You've got a special little thing and you just hold the fish up there and then you can see in this uh, blown up microscope picture you can see how small that little piece of metal is. You can also use chemicals to mark fish. And the most common one is called oxytetracycline, or OTC. This is an antibiotic. You can soak the fish in this for a short period of time. They absorb it, and they deposit it in their otolith and in, in their vertebrae and other places. And once it's absorbed, it makes a little mark. And if you then recapture that fish and you look at its spine or its otolith with a special microscope that has a particular wavelength of light, that OTC will fluoresce and will make a band. And so you can mark lots of fish this way because all you got to do is put them in a tank and dump the OTC in and let them swim around for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and it just takes a lot of work to go looking for it later, but... Um, it's more or less permanent. It's a great way to mark a lot of fish and, and then you can recover them years later and they'll still have the mark. And so here you've got an example of, of one of these marked otoliths under a, fluorescing, a fluorescent microscope and you can see the gold little ring. Here, another gold little ring. And you could uh, mark a fish and then put them in a holding pond for a couple of weeks and then mark them again and you can have two very clear marks. So um, this is a very useful way to mark a lot of fish. Uh, wave of the future is going to be DNA. We're going to, um, you know, it's already getting very affordable. Uh, I think we need to start doing more of this where we just uh, take some scale samples or something and then we can amplify the DNA and then every, we do that on every fish that we catch and then um, have the computer just tell us, hey, you know, this DNA profile matches one you caught three years ago. It's getting very affordable. It's not affordable enough to do that yet, but it's going to get there. Now, we we're talking about a mark recapture study where we can estimate the number of fish in our population, but there's lots of reasons why we want to mark fish. Uh, for example, we want to validate annuli. And so if you have a marked fish, you then recapture it, you at least know how much time has elapsed between when you marked it and when you recaptured it. And so you know how many annuli should be in between those two positions. OTC is very good for this. Um, stocking success. If you're going to rear a bunch of fish in a hatchery and then stock them, you kind of want to know if they survive. So you mark all your hatchery fish. Creel studies. So you can... Uh, if your fishermen get tagged fish and return them to you, you can get information about how many of these tagged fish are being caught by the fishermen. That's important information. Uh, movement. I talked about how the sonic tags help with movement, but you know, uh, you tag a fish somewhere. Uh, for example, I tell the story of this paddlefish that was tagged in South Dakota, and a fisherman caught it down below, I think, Barkley Dam, uh, less than a year later. And so we can infer how far that fish moved because we had the tag in it. 
You can look at things like growth rates. You know how big the fish was when you tagged it? You've recaptured it. You can see how much it's grown in that period of time. Okay, so that was all the different ways that we can mark a fish. In our final installment, we're going to talk about how we can use the mark recapture data to estimate the size of a population of fish. So come back and I'll see you in a second. So we've uh, talked about density of fish populations and we've talked a lot about how do you mark a fish. Now let's talk about how we're going to use those marked fish to estimate the density of a fish population. And so we're talking about mark recapture studies and the two most common that are used are called the Peterson mark recapture and the Schnabel mark recapture. So I mentioned kind of the broad idea here. You take a random sample of fish and you mark them. And then you release those and allow them to reintegrate into the population. Again, we want them to disperse randomly. So you've got to give them some time to do this. Then you take a second random sample and you count the number of marked fish excuse me, and the number of unmarked fish. And of course the ones that are marked you've captured a second time. We call those recaptures or recaps. So that second sample is what we want to talk about. The first sample we mark every fish and we turn them loose. Now in that second sample is it likely that all the fish you catch are going to be marked? No, of course not. Uh, most of them will probably be unmarked, you know, unless you mark a huge proportion of that, that total population. Um, is it likely in that second sample that you're going to recapture all the fish you marked in the first one? Again, not very likely. But if those fish have dispersed randomly, then the proportion of marked fish in the second sample will be equal to the proportion of marked fish in the entire population. And we can use that to our advantage. So let's just look at just a, a made up example here. Let's say I took a sample of 138 fish, all right? And each one of these fish I'm gonna mark, I'm gonna fin clip them, and I'm gonna release them. And then I'm gonna wait two or three days. Let them randomly disperse. Or I'm gonna wait a week according to this. Then I go out and take another random sample. This time, I catch 116 fish. And of those 116 fish, there are 36 recaps. So 36 of them have a fin clip, and 80 of them are unmarked, okay? Well, that means that if 36 out of 116 fish in my sample carry a mark, and if my marked fish have distributed themselves randomly, that means that same proportion are marked in the entire population. So 36 over 116 fish, 36 out of 116 fish in the entire population carries that mark. Again, if those marked fish have distributed randomly. Another way to look at this is 31% of the fish in my second sample are marked. And since these fish have distributed randomly, that means 31% of all fish are marked. Well, then I can use that, and I can use how many I marked the first time to extrapolate to the entire population. I know that I marked 138 fish. Let's say that X is our unknown. This is what we're looking for, the number of fish that are in the population. That's what we're trying to figure out. And we know that 31% of X are marked, and we know that 138 are marked. How do we know that 31% of the fish are marked? Because in our second sample, 31% of the fish were marked and we assume they distributed randomly, so 31% of all fish. Well, X is all fish, 31% of X 
equals 138. How do I know there's 138 marked in the total population? Because I marked 138 in my first sample. And so then you just solve for x. And in this example, x equals 445.2 fish. All right. Um, then we can talk about, you know, can you have 0.2 of a fish? Of course you cannot. Um, so should we round this off to whole numbers? I like to leave it in decimal form because this is just an estimate. And so if somebody saw that and saw that it was 445.2, they would realize this, this is an estimate. We don't know exactly how many fish, but this is our estimate. So that's why I like to leave at least one decimal place. Okay, so we could just redo that logic and just use the, the common um, variables. But this is the exact same logic that I just talked about. So, um, and I should mention that this way of doing a mark recapture is called the Peterson method. And I think other people think wildlifers might have a different name for it, but we call it the Peterson method in fisheries. Okay, so we're going to say R is our number of recaps. C is the total number captured in that second sample, both the recaps and the unmarked. So in my second sample, I caught a certain number of fish, that's C. And of those, the number that were marked is R. So R is always less than or equal to C. But you see what I've got here, I've got R over C. What is that? That's the proportion of fish that are marked in that second sample. The number of marked is R, the total number of fish is C. This is a proportion. Now I'm going to say M is the total number marked in the entire population. Well, how do I know this number? Because I marked them. This is what I caught in my first sample and marked. And then N is the total population size. This is our unknown. This is what we're looking for, okay? So we're just using different variables now. But again, look at what I've got here. I've got M over N, the total number marked in the population divided by the total population. This too is a proportion. It's the proportion that are marked in the entire population. But again, if the marked fish distributes themselves randomly, the proportion marked in the second sample is equal to the proportion marked in the entire population. So we can set these two things equal to each other, which is what we do right there. And then we just, you know, n is what we want, so let's just solve for n, and n equals mc over r. So that's our simple formula, but you can see how we derived it in a logical manner. And so just plugging in the numbers from my previous example, remember we caught 138 in our first sample, marked them all, that's big M. Uh, second sample we caught 116, that's C. Of those 116, 36 were marked, that's R. Plug and chug, we get 444.7, which is real close to our previous estimate. Okay, so that's the idea in a nutshell and works pretty well. There's a few things you got to think about though. What if anglers caught a bunch of fish between your first and your second sample? What would that do to your estimate? Uh, that's a question I'm going to leave for the exam. But think about it, that's something that could happen. So if you wait too long and anglers catch a bunch of fish, that could mess up your numbers. And specifically, what I want you to think about is how will that mess up your numbers? Will, or will it mess up your numbers? Or will it cause your estimate to be artificially high or your estimate to be artificially low? What if fish are born between samples? So you mark a bunch of fish and then by the time you go back out, you have a big spawn. Now you've, you know, what what is that going to do? Is that going to affect? It's going to, I'm going to tell you, it's going to affect your estimate, but how? How is it going to throw it off? Are you going to overestimate or underestimate what's out there? Uh, on what day is the estimate valid? So you get the numbers, you plug them into the formula we just did. Is that the number in the lake on the day you marked them? or on the day you recaptured them. 
again, I know, but I'm going to leave that up to you. I think we might ask that on an exam. Okay. Well, these things all hint at some assumptions that we have to make for this to be a valid technique. And you need to know these assumptions because, um, you know, clearly they're very important to the mathematics here. First assumption, equal mortality and equal emigration between the marked and the unmarked. So you can have mortality and you can have emigration with fish leaving as long as it's at an equal rate between the marked and the unmarked fish. The marked and the unmarked need to be equally likely to be captured. Um, this seems straightforward, but you know you can't lose the mark, right? That will influence your results. We've made a big deal about this already, that the marked distribute themselves randomly. Again, this is sort of uh, common sense. All marks are recognized. So you've got trained people that know to look for a fin clip or something. Now, whereas you can have mortality and emigration, you can't have births and immigration. If you have births and immigration, that's going to mess up your numbers. All right, let me go back. Um, so the thing you have to ask yourself is, how realistic are these assumptions? And you look at them and you go, well, we might have a problem with some of these. For example, equal mortality between the marked and the unmarked. Um, well, you can imagine how this could not be true, right? Uh, if you capture a fish and you handle them and then you mark them, you know, maybe the mark gets infected or you're handling them, you're stressing them out. I mean, that's a lot of extra stress those marked fish are subje uh, subjected to. And so it's very likely that the marked fish have a higher mortality rate. Um, you know, one could argue that uh, sometimes when you mark a fish, you give them a dose of antibiotic to kind of counteract that. Well, that could make their mortality lower than the unmarked because now they've got a boost of antibiotics. Um, the marked and the unmarked are equally likely to be captured. Well, can you imagine a scenario when this is not true? Well, I can. Um, I mean, you know, often we say in a lot of our gears, we're catching the slow and the stupid. And so if a fish is marked, that means it was dumb enough to be caught once, and it might be dumb enough to be caught a second time, whereas a more savvy fish never gets caught. Um, you could look at how the mark, the tag, might make the fish more vulnerable. For example, you got a big floy tag sticking out of your dorsal fin. It might hang up on a net. More, you know, make you more likely to be um, captured. Um, another thing you can think about is uh, some fish, um, you know, I guess this is not maybe so much for fish, but for some organisms, they might not mind being captured at all. This happened um, with a friend of mine was doing a mark recapture on some uh, turtles, and he was remarking one day about how he just kept catching the same turtles over and over again. Well, it makes perfect sense. You know, the turtle, uh, once it goes in that trap and it finds the dead fish and, okay, it gets caught and it gets a little mark put on them, what's a turtle care? You know, a snapping turtle especially. And so the next day, hey, look, there's this net again. Great. And he goes right back in. They, so some organisms become trap happy because they don't mind being in the trap. So that violates this assumption. Um, don't lose the mark. Well, we talked about how with a lot of external tags in fish, it's very likely you can lose the mark. In fact, it's a good uh, practice to sort of get an estimate of what your tag loss is. Uh, the marks distribute themselves randomly. Well, how likely do you think that is? I mean, fish tend to have home ranges. And so you catch a fish near a certain area and you release it, it's going to stay around that certain area. Um, fish that are caught together might be uh, related. They, they, you know, they might hang out in a social group. So you can't necessarily assume that that's going to be true. Uh, all marks are recognized. 
Um, that's pretty straightforward. No births or immigration. Well, the longer you wait between samples, the more likely this is going to happen. Um, you know, one thing to think about with this math, and again, this is something I might leave for the exam to ask you later, but you know, how come you can have mortality as long as it's equal, but you can't have births? Uh, you can have immigration as long as it's equal between marked and unmarked, but you can't have immigration. Think about why that might be. So these assumptions are sometimes tenuous. And so a lot of times we will try to get some data to show that they're not so bad. Again, the example being the uh, tag retention. And, and you can either collect some data and say, look, they do retain the tags very well, or we estimate they lose X percent of tags and we can adjust our numbers uh, that way. Um, but these are things you have to keep in mind when you're doing a mark recapture uh, study. So that's Peterson method, and it's pretty slick, but we can make it better, all right? So in the Peterson method, we took two samples. First one, we marked everything. Second one, we took our data. We're done. But what if we sampled a lot more? If we kept going out, instead of having two samples, we have four, five, six, ten. We just keep going out. And every time we sample, we're going to get some marked fish and some unmarked fish. And we can record those numbers, but then all the unmarked ones will mark. Well, what's going to happen? Every time we go out, we're going to mark fish. We're going to mark fish. The number of marked fish in our population is going to go up, up, up. Now, what if, just theoretically, what if we kept doing this for a long time? What would happen? Well, eventually you would mark every fish in the population, right? And if you mark every fish in the population, then you know how many fish are in the population. And that's as good an estimate as you can get. So you can see logically by having more samples and increasing the number of marked fish each time, we can get a better and better estimate. And that we'll call the Schnabel multiple mark recapture technique. So it's the same technique it's very similar math. It's just many samples, and every time you get an unmarked fish after you record it, you mark it. Um, and we have a slightly different formula, but you'll recognize that it's basically the same format as the Peterson. So you remember Peterson was CM over R. Now it's the sum of C times M over the sum of R which just means that each time we go out, we have uh, you know, the number of fish we caught, the number of those that are marked. Um, we're gonna do some of these exercises because these numbers can be a little confusing, um, and, but if you do the math, it's straightforward. Of course, N is population size. J is how many samples you take. C sub T is the number captured in sample T, so each uh, time you go out, that's a sample. The total number in each of those samples is C sub T, and we multiply that by M sub T. This is the only tricky one, that when you're doing the math, when you're setting up a spreadsheet, it's difficult for people to get this number right. This is the total number marked at large prior to sample T. Now, if you think about Peterson, M was the number that were marked in the lake. All right, um, and it's the same kind of thing. If you think about Peterson, the number marked in the lake are the total number marked at large before you took that sa second sample in Peterson. This is the same idea. It's the total number marked at large before you take the sample. Not after you take the sample because you're gonna mark a bunch when the sample, all right? Another way to think about this, it's the number of possible recaps in sample T, which is exactly the same thing in the Peterson model, right? The number of marked fish is the number of possible recaps when you took your second sample. And so setting this up, and, and this is the one thing, but if you, if you remember this definition, it will be very clear when you do the, the uh, problems. Of course, R is the actual number of recaps in sample T.
And so then we just do this for each sample, we sum them up, we plug them in, and we get our estimate. And nice thing is um, we can get you know estimates of confidence intervals and everything. Um, so usually the multiple mark recapture technique is the one that we use most of the time. The assumptions are the same, and if you had a downside, you could say, well, if I'm doing multiple uh, sampling, that's a longer period of time, it's more likely I'm going to have births and immigration and loose tags and things like that. But usually we say the trade-off is worth it because you get better data. Now, there are other ways to estimate population size too. And just these two are the, the basis of it and the ones we most commonly use. Um, these other techniques have different assumptions. Um, sometimes in, they're more appropriate or realistic. So if you're in a particular, uh, you know, you want to do a little research to find out if there isn't a, a maybe a little bit better way. But really, uh, you know, the Schnabel multiple mark recapture technique is still um, pretty common. One that you will run into quite a bit is called Jolly Sieber, and this is for open populations. The ones I just showed you are for closed populations, like a pond, where you don't really expect the fish to escape or too many fish to come in. But a lot of fish populations are open, say a river population, where you've got this huge river that you can't sample the whole thing, and it's, you know, uh, spread out and it, it sort of has a beginning and it sort of has an end but there's no uh, enclosures there and so fish can move in and out talk about fish in the ocean um, and so a lot of times um, people use a different technique called the Jolly Sieber technique has different assumptions use a different math um, where you don't have time to get into it right now but that's if you ever see that or if you're ever in that sort of a fish population this is the sort of technique you're going to use okay so that's it. Let's wrap this up. Um, these lectures were about fish density. Um, it's one of the characteristics of a population. It's important to know. We use catch per unit of effort as a surrogate for density in most instances, but we would like to make sure that it correlates well with density. So we like to get an estimate of the population size. There are lots of reasons why we'd want the actual size of the population. And there are lots of ways to do that, but the most common is a mark recapture. Uh, if you got a mark recapture, you gotta be able to mark fish. There's lots of ways to mark fish. We talked about that. And then we talked about ways you can use the data to estimate population size. And um, so that's what I've got. And it's getting dark, so it's time to go in. Um, thanks for listening. Let me know if you got any questions, and we'll see you in class.